So when does a patient qualify for comprehensive care? Usually it's going to involve increasing the vertical, but maybe not always. But even if we're not changing the vertical, let's say we're doing just a veneer case, we still need to look at a few diagnostic issues. So let's go to our diagnostic chart. And that's the diagnosis. These are the things that I want to look at. Number one, do they have TMD symptoms? TMD symptoms can be a lot of different things. I'm mainly looking for a head or neck pain. It could be joint pain, but usually it's a muscle pain, particularly if they talk about having headaches, neck aches, we need to dig a little deeper into that. Quite often, overworked muscles with the head or neck is going to cause discomfort because we have a buildup of acid in the muscles, particularly if someone's overclosed. If someone is overclosed, it takes more energy for those muscles to function. And as a result, people can become fatigued and they can go into parafunctional activity, particularly grinding, even though there's other components of why people grind, such as psychomotor. If that center portion of the brain, which is the emotional area of the brain, is hyperactive, which could be from stress, and I saw this a lot during COVID, is people will grind more. And as a result, they can get tooth pain and they get more wear and tear. So we're going to be looking for head and neck pain. If we do see patients with head and neck pain, we really need to look at that closely, particularly with those neural sensitivities. And I'll post that video below, make sure you look at neural sensitivities because if people are highly sensitive to their five senses, they're gonna be more sensitive to different occlusal anomalies. And as a result, these patients can be a challenge, particularly if we're gonna change the occlusion, but quite often changing that occlusion and giving them the time to adapt to a new occlusal scheme can make all the difference in their quality of life in decreasing these stresses. It's usually a lot more than just a bite. It's gonna be the posture of the patient, what's the condition of the neck, what's the condition of the jaw position, particularly the fossa, the condyle in the fossa. People that are overclosed have a tendency to have a compressed condylar position to the cranial base and that's when the condylar head is positioned up and back and we don't see a central location of that condyle on the lateral pole in that fossa and i'll go through that a little bit more in another video but these are the big pictures that i'm looking for so really look for head and neck pain those patients will need to be worked up in a way to make sure we're addressing that head and neck issue seeing what their ability is to adapt before we ever start restoring them. That's really, really important to know that. A lot of clients that we restore have excessive wear and tear, meaning their teeth are worn down. Particularly if I see a lot of wear and tear in that anterior region, I'm really going to start looking for the range of motion when they're functioning and they're colliding on those anterior teeth, getting excessive wear. Those patients are usually overclosed. Now, some clients that we'll see are overclosed without a lot of tooth wear, just in their natural development patterns, such as class two, II, division twos. Those people usually have deep bites, but a lot of times they're vertical chewers. So we can address them differently, but I'm really looking for evidence of a lot of wear and tear and determining, do I need to increase the vertical to give them the proper length of anterior teeth? and the function of where they're not going to have biomechanical issues of where they're going to destroy what we're doing for them. And then I talked about neural sensitivity in another video. You've got to include that into the package. You got to know who you're working with and how you're going to work through that. And also look at the aesthetic focus. Quite often when we look at anterior teeth, there are certain principles that we're wanting to consider to make sure it's a pleasant smile, such as do the incisal edges follow the curvature of the lower lip? What's the length of the teeth for the patient? Do they show enough teeth? Uh, what are their phonetics like? There's a lot of things we want to look at in working up our diagnosis, but we do want to have this one principle. We do want to know the target length of the centrals. 
The target length of the central sets up our occlusal plane for the upper arch, and that will also dictate the vertical that we need to achieve. And there's a formula for that that we're gonna go through in another video, but right now we're talking big picture right now, right? So when I'm considering and having that conversation with a patient about comprehensive care, you can see there's a lot of issues that can be there. It can be Team D issues in a combination with excessive wear, neural sensitivities, and an aesthetic focus, or it may be just a few of those objectives that the patient is looking for. Regardless, we want to work a patient through a systematic workup to make sure that we know where we're gonna go. Now, historically, we always start with a wax up, right? I don't always do initially a wax up. One thing that I have found that helps me very well is using what we call the Shimbashi measurement. So at that very first exam, the Shimbashi measurement will allow me to kind of get a feel for where that patient is. And the definition of the Shimbashi measurement is this. It's the measurement between the CEJ of the upper and lower central, pick either the left and right, and the average for that is 18 millimeters plus or minus two. So how did Dr. Shimbashi come up with these measurements? What he did is he measured clients that had ideal occlusal function without Team D and he found a certain trend. And there's other studies that have shown this to be very effective. The other thing we have to think about when we're using the Shimbashi is why increase the vertical? Well, first of all, a ideal vertical dimension of occlusion improves facial aesthetics by positively affecting the facial skeletal angles. And we can determine that from a step. For instance, look at this case. I did this case quite a number of years ago. Take a look at the difference between an overclosed skeletal system and a restored skeletal vertical dimension via the occlusion. Now the occlusion is just not one axis. There's a lot of different angles that we're looking at in occlusion. We're looking at vertical, we're looking at AP position, and that's the anterior posterior position. We're looking at the yaw, and we're looking to see if there's a compressed jaw joint, because quite often that means that the posterior dimension could be off, different than the anterior dimension. So it's just not the incisal pin. And there's ways that we'll figure this out, but we're just talking big picture right now. So we do know that increasing the vertical dimension can improve the skeletal features of the face, and usually it will also improve muscle function. The second thing that we're looking at in considering a Shimbashi measurement. If we have distalized joints, which we call compression, and the joint space is compressed up and back, by increasing the vertical dimension, it will often decompress the TMD joints, allowing the jaw muscles to function at their maximum ideal length. Now, when that happens, people don't have the pain, particularly within the masseters and the anterior temporalis. This anterior temporalis muscle here, right here on the side of the face, if people are overclosed and having to retract their jaw during that envelope of function, they're gonna become fatigued, particularly if they run into grinding. Now, I'm slightly compressed back, but I don't have TMD symptoms. I had four premolars extracted as a kid, and I don't have a lot of excessive wear. Even though my joints are slightly distalized, I can function okay with that. Now, I do wear a sleep appliance at night because I have a limited pharyngeal space. So that does help me out. Take that same condition to another patient and they could have some major issues. So we do need to look at the muscle tone and how the patient is functioning in that envelope of function. So you'll see right here in this diagram that when this jaw is closing, the anterior guidance is having to bring the jaw back from an anterior position. That's a function that I'm not wanting to go for, particularly with the envelope of function. I would prefer to have an envelope of function that's right on that arc. Whenever I do jaw tracking, I want that patient to close naturally in their swallow without having to pull their jaw back. And as a result, this anterior temporalis and lateral pterygoids don't work as much, and they're gonna have a better swallow and function. The other thing I'm looking at, particularly with a Shimbashi measurement, if they're overclosed and they have wear and tear, is they have broad occlusal contacts, which usually means that 
their curve of Wilson's reversed. So they'll have heavy, heavy broad contacts on the buckle of the lower working cusp and the lingual of the upper working cusp. And what happens in that situation is they start losing their vertical dimension and that lower jaw will start to compress back, back, back and CO. And that can take a while to happen and they may even start getting more crowding on the lower anteriors. I just had a patient in the other day that said, I didn't used to have crowding down here and it started to crowd when they were 50 years old. Well, that's what happened is that wear and tear. When we restore a vertical to a Shimbashi function, it gives us enough room to design the occlusal contacts to make them morphologically ideal. It idealizes the forces down the long axis of the roots. With this type of occlusion, the loading force can best be dispersed to protect the teeth and the TMD joint. So there's a lot of factors of occlusion, and that's how we refine a case, but it's that lower jaw position to the cranial base. So here's my basic definition of what I'm going for when we're restoring a client. And I call it centric reference. And that is, I don't want too much anterior guidance. I don't mind anterior guidance. With a proper vertical restored like a Shimbashi, anterior guidance is only used 6% of the time. So if we're having to lock them in there with really steep anterior guidance, that could be a problem. So anterior glidance is my goal with the proper Shimbashi vertical and the definition of centric reference, which is a Clem made up term, is the most optimal physiological, which is the functional neural side, and the anatomical, which is the jaw joint location of the lower jaw to the cranial base. So what does that mean? I don't want compressed jaw joints. And that's where I find the CBCT so helpful. I take that on every adult patient that I'm treating. In fact, I use that as my normal exam protocol and it really helps me to understand the functionality of that patient in their function and where they've come from. If they have condyles that are really beaked, I know that happened in their developmental phase of their life. If they have condyles that aren't beaked but they're more compressed up and back, then I know they have an occlusal overclosed issue. So by looking at the jaw, morphology at the lateral poles, we can look at the angle of the condyle to that maxillary cranial bone to give us a good idea on where that patient needs to go and what they have been doing. So non-compressed jaw joints are really important in my clinical theater now and the CBCT really helps us out with that. I used to use tomograms. So I've been using joint focused x-rays for well over 20 years. And in another video, I'll kind of go through some things to look for in this journey. When I have an ideal vertical dimension and the jaw is not retracted and compressed back to the cranial base when that patient closes, the muscles will be more at an optimal length and relaxed tone. What does that mean? They don't have muscle pain. And that's really what I want to look at in diagnosis. That's what we use a removable appliance for is to determine whether the symptoms can be altered with a occlusal appliance that's in a balanced position. And the third component that I'm really looking at in considering how I'm going to restore a patient is when they're opening and closing, are they in a retrusive jaw retracted closing pattern? And if they are, we want to look at that. I use jaw tracking to determine that and it helps me to understand the client. If we get a proper Shimbashi, more than likely that's going to take care of itself. Patients will go where their subconscious mind tells them to go. And if we don't lock them in, they'll kind of work it out on their own. And that's why it's so important to go through a diagnostic phase, particularly with a removable appliance, because it helps us to assess a patient, both in working out a retreated jaw position if they're overclosed, and it helps us to understand how they're going to adapt. And that's where I like the CAD CAM lower orthotic or splint, you could call it either way, is that it helps patients to adapt to a new vertical. You can see what their symptoms are and it helps you to work through that phase of the case. Well, uh, immediately after the first night, one, I slept through the entire night, so I didn't wake up. Two, I noticed immediately that I didn't have the pain or headache in the morning or that tension in the back or the tension like I've had every night when I wake up. Um, I didn't feel like 
Um, my teeth were sore because I'm a Bruxer. So um, I guess I'm stressed and during the night. Um, that was immediate. So I felt amazing just having that appliance out. Over the course of the weeks, um, I noticed that I was looking forward to go to bed because that settled me mentally because um, I knew I'd get some sleep. Um, and then even long term, um, with my overall health, BP's gone down, my triglyceride count, which was very high, um, went down significantly and my uh, doctor is saying, what did you do? I'm like, well, I'm sleeping better for one, less stress, I'm sleeping through the night, there's no interactions. Um, I'm not waking up in pain or headaches because we're, we're discussing why am I having headaches? Is it hypotensive? Is the triglycerides? It could be a array of different things. Um, she's like, what changed? And I'm like, well, I've had this appliance in that Dr. Clem made and um, I sleep so much better. In fact, I, I feel naked during the day not having it on. Uh, that's why I literally look forward to wearing it at night, which is weird because I'm like, most people are like, you're crazy. You're wearing it like a night guard or an orthotic or some sort um, at night is, uh, a, a nuisance and it will keep you up. It doesn't feel like I have it in my mouth. In fact, when I feel like when it's out of my mouth, uh, it doesn't feel right. So um, it's kind of weird. I, I kind of look forward to it at the end of the night because I'm ready, I'm settled, go to, and I'm gonna have a great sleep. So I haven't had sleep in many years. I didn't realize like how that impacted my body. And then the next day, the amount of energy that I actually had because I actually got good sleep, so REM or whatever you want to call it. So, um, significantly changed my life. I know that she was happy because I was feeling better. So, um, there was not, I guess, not mental fatigue or stress, as well as physical that I was carrying. Um, again, like a weight was not just off me, but maybe off her too. So, that helps our marriage, right? And sleep and everything. So, um, indirectly, that helps our marriage. She was happy. So. so thus far in this video, this is an overview. It's kind of a big topic. I'm touching just the surface. We could spend several days just on this topic. And my goal here for this video is to tap you into some of the things that you have learned in the past and tie all these things together. There's a lot of different platforms of occlusion based on who you learn them from. And I've gained a wealth of knowledge from a lot of different educators through the years. What I'm conveying in this series of videos in this channel is a template that will allow you to use the systems that you're familiar with and work through comprehensive care. And that's where I like the digital platform. I want to make sure we find a diagnostic pathway with a removal appliance in most cases. And once we have the ability to assess that, we want to move them into a fixed jaw position with prepless onlays and veneers when needed that will allow us to fully work out their occlusion before we ever prep them for the final restorations. And this pathway, when increasing the vertical, will allow us to move someone back into general dentistry once we have their occlusion worked out. And then we restore them in sections so we can work with the occlusion that has been successful and where the patient has already adapted to. And that is the beauty of the template and the workflow that I'm going to be conveying in this channel. So if you have any questions or comments, make sure you post them below. I wanna hear what you have to say, and I will see you, that's right, I'll see you in that next video.